Christmas, Merry Christmas. A lot of red, a lot of red. You guys look great, you guys look great. Good to be here. I just feel like it's a, just a massive party, big family gathering. So on behalf of all of us at Grace, the elders, the pastoral staff, we just wanna welcome you guys. Thanks for coming in. It's just such a privilege and an honor just to, to host you guys, to open up our doors, just to say thanks for coming. Really, really good to see you. I don't know if you guys are coming in from out of state, out of city, and you guys are having family in, and this is maybe the first stop, but man, just such a, such a privilege to have you guys here. Or maybe you're part of the family here, and this is the first stop so that you guys can get out of town. So travel safe, whatever it looks like, whether you guys are coming or going. So uh, as the scripture says, blessed you're going in. Come on, somebody, blessed you're going out. Man, it's, um, it's a good time of year for sure, but uh, I wanted to make sure you guys are aware we will not be here on Christmas Day, all right? So we're, we're, um, we're, we're making sure that we equip you to be at home, hang out, and on the way out, we are uh, supplying you with a very special message. So grab this piece of paper, one per family. So if you're gonna be in multiple homes, grab as many as you need. We put this uh, awesome piece of, I know, it looks normal, eight and a half, by 11. It is not a normal piece of paper. It's cardstock. All right, anyway, but um, <laughs> grab one of these on your way out, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what they are because it's just a mystery. This is to help you take the gospel message home around your family and be able to participate in telling the gospel message. Anytime on Christmas Day, the 25th, you can log on to our website, and there's a video that we've already recorded for you to do on demand anytime. So if you're going up at 3 a.m., it's ready for you. Three in the afternoon, it's still ready for you. Any time of day on Christmas, we're going to do a message and a song that is all geared around how to facilitate the gospel message right there at home. So grab one on your way out. You can do it with kids or you can do it with adults. Same piece of paper. So we just want to supply you to do that because we're not going to be here. Cool? So I don't, know, I don't know if you just caught that, but we just ordained all of you. <laughs> that was it. Like just boom, we're sending you guys out. All right, well, we're going to jump right in. Man, it's such a good time of year, and I don't know about you, but um, Christmas really evokes for me a time of stories. Like the Peterson household, we're, we're usually all storytellers. At night, we usually go to bed, and we usually, we usually tell stories while our kids are getting ready for bed. Um, we love to come home and share stories about our day, uh, but Christmas just seems to be elevated. You know, everybody loves a good story, right? I mean, stories do something that mere facts and data just can't do. You know, stories invoke areas of the heart where sometimes data and just information just like stimulate your mind. But, but everybody loves a good story. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever you have good stories, sometimes you go and experience something during the day, and then you come back and you can't wait to tell your family, oh, you will not believe what happened to me. You're like, sit down. And then you're trying to articulate what happened and your words get all jumbled and, and the order of the story gets mixed up and you totally ruin the story. Come on, anybody ever been there before? The worst part about a great story is it's, it's, it's ruined. Like, you're like, oh, this is amazing. And, and then whatever comes out of your mouth is not what you just experienced. And the only way to rescue this train wreck is to be like, well, you just had to be there. You know, you, it's your fault. I mean, I can't even articulate it, but it's just, you know, it's, I don't even know what to do right now. <laughs> but the, the bad thing is the stories that we tell are massively important. And I don't know when this happened or why this happened, but I think we have officially ruined the Christmas story. You know, one way that we have taken the Christmas story and ruined it is by taking the amazing main character, God himself, and removed him and put us in the middle of it. I feel like we've taken Christmas and just taken the main character. You know, we have this amazing message. We have this amazing story about, namely, God, how he looked at humanity and he wanted to save us and he came down and he made the effort. And then here we are. We can't even fit the one day into an entire month properly because it's such an exciting time. To, you know, Christmas just spills over an entire, entire month. 
And even that, we, we tend to wreck and ruin. It's supposed to be a peaceful, joyful time of year, and <laughs> we're just stressed and, and worried and anxious, and, and we make it about materialism and commercialized things. And what happened? What happened to the main character of the story? One way to ruin a great story is that you, you make the main character, you, you swap them out, and you put you in the place. It'd be like me coming home at the end of my day and greeted by my kids coming up to, hey, how was, how was your day? Oh, it was, it was actually amazing. I mean, I'm not, just since you ask, I'll tell you. I actually, um, I saved the world today. <laughs> really? How'd you do that? Well, I mean, I had x-ray vision. I lifted uh, buildings up. I actually flew. I had a cape. And, and, and right there at the moment, they're like, wait, this sounds a lot like Superman. It sounds like super. Are you are you saying you did you did you're actually super? No, that's not what I. And so it's it's easy how we can just ruin stories by just filtering out, taking the main character out and putting putting us in the middle of it. And that's exactly what we've done with the Christmas story. We've taken this amazing message and and we've put ourselves in the middle of not only the Christmas story but our lives. You know, we say things like, "Well, I'm I make the decisions here." I guide my own life. I'm a self-made man. I am the, finish this, I am the captain of my, yeah, we say this stuff all the time. This is, we, okay, you know what, maybe we're a society that's right, meek and mild. We don't say it, but we certainly think it. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why God came down is because the way we are leading this life, the way that we are leading this world, the way that we are forecasting this earth is not going so well. And so the trajectory of you and I being in charge hasn't really namely gone well over the history of whenever we actually see and read through this scripture. There's a cycle of this repeated nature. Man's got it. Hey guys, let's, let's just take it from here. God's like, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'm coming down. I'm intervening. No, 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 we, we got it. We got it. We're going we're gonna to do well. God's like, no, 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 no. I'm messing that thing up again. And then, and then we just take it into our own hands and we start murdering in people. God comes down to rescue. And then we start stealing, pe- stealing things. And God starts coming down and intervening. It's a cycle of us ruining it and then God coming down to rescue the plan yet again. Aren't you thankful for a God who doesn't leave us where we are, but intervenes, interjects, interrupts our story and comes down into the middle of it and it says, before you ruin the entire day, <laughs> let me just come in and take over here. Instead of you being the captain of your ship, instead of you being king over your life, let me just interject. And this is one of the main reasons why God sent down his son. Jesus was actually in a conversation with a power-hungry official named Pilate. This is at the end of his life. And Jesus alludes to why he was born. Look at this in John chapter 18. In John chapter 18, Jesus has a conversation with a man named Pilate. He's a, one of the head officials over the Roman Empire. He's a big deal. And so Jesus actually strikes up conversation and says, hey, are you actually a king? And he said, yeah, that's, that's me. Are you the king of the Jews? You have an entire kingdom coming down. Now, any Rome official would acknowledge how big that is. Are you going to overthrow the system that we have here? This is the conversation that happened. Pilate said to him, so you're a king, to Jesus. So you're a king. This is at the end of his life. So you're a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. And for this purpose, I was born. Come on, somebody. Jesus said, for this purpose, I was born. I came down because humanity has a tendency to put themselves as king of their life. And I need to be in that place. I am the king of their life. I'm inviting humanity. You, maybe today, you've never taken up this invitation so that you would stop making decisions for yourself. Stop deciding your future. Stop guiding your life. Stop authoring your tomorrows and start to give that pen up and say, God, I want you to start being the king over my life so you can establish your kingdom. Just as you did, you had this conversation. Why was he born? So that he can come down and a king could set up his kingdom. Now, this is not a fairy tale. 
This happened. God sent his son in a perfect heaven all the way down to a wrecked, broken, messed up, discombobulated earth so that he can set up a king over his kingdom and start moving the reality of our humanity in a different direction. He invades what it is that we call normal. This changes everything. A king coming down, heaven coming to earth. Come on, somebody. The invisible invading the visible. The heavens, joy, mercy. Anybody interested? Compassion and love coming down to invade, engulf, and saturate our today, our tomorrows, our life, our minds, our relationship, our everything. When Jesus came down and he said, this is why I came a king to set up his kingdom. It was an invasion of one world to be inundated with another. I remember when my wife and I started to date and we got engaged and then we were moving into marriage. I I remember one of the languages that we used were, were two worlds colliding together. We were gonna have two worlds. I can't wait for two worlds to collide together. The way God says it is the two shall become one flesh. And so it is with the relationship. That's why God literally says over you, his church, his bride, he uses a marital relationship to say the two will become one flesh. You don't have a life anymore. It's my life in you that lives. You don't direct your tomorrows. God says, if you give that over to me, I have plans that I want to write for you. I have plans I want to direct you. I have a future because I am the God of, come on somebody, yesterday, today, and forevermore. This is who God is. When he came down and he was born into society, whenever Isaiah 9 says, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, it changes everything. This story isn't just a story, it's the story that changes and wrecks our life because it's, it's one world invading and colliding into another. So if it is, if maybe this is just speculation to you, maybe this is just theory, but let's just say God was in heaven, he did send down his son, being born of a virgin so that he can live our life that we could never give us purpose. Let's just say he did that then how would he then go about inviting us into that? How would he start to describe his reality? Like imagine this, you go on vacation for a week and you come back and you, you tell everybody where you were. I was, I was um, on vacation, and was in the tropics, Caribbean, should have seen the beaches, The water was clear. You start to describe everything that you experienced. Why? Well, obviously, you want to make everybody jealous. You know, (laughs) kidding. You want to have everybody else experience what you just were inundated with, right? That's what I just experienced was (laughs) amazing. And you just want to share that. This is God. He came down from heaven and he comes down and and he shares his kingdom. But the question is, how does he do it? If his birth was inconspicuous, if his arrival from heaven to earth was really subtle subtle and, and mysterious, then how does he go about sharing his kingdom? Your answer may not be obvious, may not even be your plan, may may not be your strategy. If if you were God, you probably would have done it differently. But Jesus' strategy to share his kingdom was through story, sharing stories. He came down and he said, let me, let me tell you a story. In fact, scripture says that he didn't tell his disciples anything unless it was a story. Stories do something that facts can't do. Now, Jesus could have come down fully God, fully man, and just told people, this is what you need to do. Stop doing this. Stop, doing, do this, don't do this. He could have done that, but then he would have just been a dictator. But because Jesus came down representing a good, perfect father, he came down like any good dads, he was sharing stories. Let me tell you about another reality. Let me tell you about another way to live. Let me tell you about another way to think. 
Let me tell you something about how to reconcile relationships. Let me tell you something about compassion and love and patience and persistence. Let me tell you stories that provoke you to action. The beautiful part about this is whenever Jesus tells stories, they start to stir inside of our hearts. They start to stir our minds and dream about another reality. And that's exactly the point. I love what Jared Wilson says. Very simply, this is what he says. Once upon a time, a king came to the earth to tell stories. And the stories contain the mystery of eternal life. (laughs) I love that. Once upon a time. You want a good story? Let me tell you one. Once upon a time, a king came down to earth to tell stories. And in those stories contained the words, stories, the emotions that we could now hold on to that embraced eternal life. Mark chapter 4 is the style of Jesus inviting you and I into this particular story. Mark chapter 4 says this. Whenever Jesus gathered his disciples, he said, with many such parables, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. He didn't speak to them without a parable or a story. He didn't speak to them without a story, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. No matter where he was going, he was saying, let me, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Again with the stories, Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wasn't a daydreamer. These weren't whimsical stories just to waste time. See, sometimes you and I fill in the gaps. I don't know what else to do, so let's just tell a story and make it up as you go. Currently, um, the Peterson tribe at our home, before we go to bed, we have a a story of the three bears, and it's not the story that you're thinking, uh, because we make this up as we go. So every single chapter, it just gets elaborated on. Uh, These three bears have already been skydiving, Uh, These three bears have been scuba diving. They have been um, riding their bicycles. They read their Bibles, though, let me just tell you. Um, They live together in a tree. They work at the bee factory, all right? So that's that's the story that we go about. Right now, I think we're currently on chapter 34. We're making progress, all right? 34 times we've told this. Not every night, but we tell stories. This is what we do. This is what fathers do. We tell stories. Why? Because we're, we're trying to, for the moment, we're trying to allow our minds, our hearts to invade another reality, be engulfed in something greater for the moment. This is what Jesus is interested in. Telling stories, not just any stories. Sometimes we make it up, but Jesus' stories were, they were, they were life-changing because stories always are filled with words and words that Jesus spoke had life in them. Jesus says, the words I speak to you have spirit and life. That's why he is the only one that can say, I came to give you life and life, come on somebody, abundantly. He said, my words can set you free. He said, if you hold on to my words, you'll never taste death. He said, if you hold on to my words, then you will be seeing things, a purpose. There'll be a, like a lamp on your feet. You'll be guided. The words that I'm telling you, Jesus says, are full of vibrance. They're full of life. They're full of purpose. They're full of potential. They're like a seed. He tells a a parable, a story about his teaching. Every word that I speak is like a seed, the potential that has millions of different seeds and trees in them. The power that is in these words have clarity to give us purpose so that we can find out what God's doing. John chapter 8, look at this, John chapter 8. This is just one mention of the power of Jesus' words. John chapter 8, so Jesus said to the Jews, if you abide in my words, you truly are my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth, we say this with me, and the truth will set you free. These are not just stories. They're they're not just made up as as he wants to tell them. They're stories that are filled with life, stories that teach us how to live. The stories that are inside here couldn't contain, if you wrote them all down, libraries wouldn't be able to fill them up. They would just be too big. Too many books, 
Too many pages, too many stories, too many truths. Truths that all depend on the listener. You know, stories can just be one ear and out the other. Stories can be distant. Stories don't have to change your life, but, but the stories and the invitation that Jesus gives us, that's why he came. To come down to live a life that you and I couldn't. A king coming down to set up his kingdom so that he can tell stories that in them had the words of eternal life. Words that if we really hid them, we would get rid of the sin, we'd get rid of the destruction, we'd see life come in us. Words and stories that if we really truly believed them and we trusted in them, that we would be ruled and reigned with peace, not anxiety. Stories that Jesus gave us that would literally renew our mind. Stories and words that would come alive within us and birth things that we didn't even think were possible. Stories in which if we were to listen to, believe, and trust in, that we would see God do more than we would ask, dream of, or imagine. This is a God that is literally a grace-filled, mercy-bound God that does more than we even ask. This is a gracious Father. This is our God. One way to ruin a story is to take the entire main character and take him out and put us in the place. But how to redeem a great story is to put God right back in the middle of it. Our Christmas story isn't really about us. It's about the generosity of God. Our Christmas story is about a father who loved us so much that he sent his son not so that we could live the same life, not so that we could just keep on going like nothing happened 2,000 years ago, not so that we could just get up and live our own life and make our own decisions. He came as a king, and he's not interested in two people sitting up on the king and the throne and making decisions of your heart. He's interested in those who you created. God fashioned you. He designed you so that you can be in relationship with him, but not so that you can make the decisions, so that he can make the decisions and establish his kingdom. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His government will last forever. He is the wonderful counselor. Come on, somebody. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. That's who is prophesied over, not just the baby, but the father and the son and the Holy Spirit in which we see inside of the Bible. That's the one that we submit our life to. That's the one that we trust and say, God, you know the direction of my life. You know what's best. You tell me how to think. You tell me how to process this. You tell me how to provoke my emotions to do good. God, you are the one that transforms and fills up my life. Amen. This this is what stories do. They set us free. They set us free. They set us free. And if Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. I want to read you uh, something. This is the power of stories. I think it's going to be up on the screen here. Good stories. Good stories. They're interlaced lessons that have both personal and provoking. They activate something inside of us to come alive, to live courageously and awaken our senses to a better reality, a reality that we were unaware of until we heard the story. Stories anchor us firmly in the now, but they set sail to a better tomorrow. They simultaneously take down all the defenses and they reveal who we are, taking us deeply while rescuing us from who we think we are. Stories open wide our eyes to the stunning drama of God all around us. While every detail is necessary, no one is superfluous. Stories make it impossible to live a selfish life while stepping closer to seeing the impossible happen. That's the power of stories. Jesus came down once upon a time. A king was sent to earth to tell stories, and those stories contained eternal life. So the question is, if that's his mission, if that's his plan, if that's his purpose for coming, 
to come down to be born inside of a humanity, to share the story, to provoke us to have a relationship so that we can be forgiven and free before him in right standing because of Jesus. If that's why he came and he did it sharing stories, then the question is, what are you going to do with the words? What are you going to do with the stories? Luke chapter 2 is our famous and iconic Christmas story where we read usually the days are decreed and it went out where Caesar Augustus had to register for all of the world. Joseph and Mary came in to be registered and there in Bethlehem, the city of David was born to you the Savior, the child of God himself named Jesus. I want to read this part to you because this is just a small glimpse of the example of what happens with a bunch of shepherds who realize that on a normal day, tending sheep, doing the night shift, they are invaded by a God and a reality. And their response is what we should do in response with the rest of our life. Verse 8, it says, In the same region there were some shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with, will you say that with me? They were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news and great joy that will be for all people. I don't know about you, but if you're not joyful, if you're just not having a good day, It does not help when people come up to you and say, why aren't you joyful? It it doesn't provoke any smiles on my face for you to be like, man, pretty sad today, aren't you? You're just not joyful at all. Are you ever going to be joyful? I, I recognize the state that I'm in is not one of joy. But to get me out into a state of joy isn't to remind myself of where I am. To take me out of my stupor or my sorrow or my depression, you have to put me into another reality that provokes joy. That's what happened to the shepherds. They were just doing the familiar mundane labor intensive things that they would do every single day. Manual labor out there in the fields, picking up sheep because they're ignorant, bring them back, back to the green pastures. Don't go over there, it's a cliff. Bring it back. I saved your life, but you're never going to thank me. This is the day of the shepherds. And then all of a sudden, the mundane reality got invaded by an angel. Don't fear. Don't fear. Make haste. This will be a sign to you. Go check out the boy. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's in the manger. And they did. And the shepherds... Verse 20, look at this. And the shepherds returned. What were they doing? Glorifying and praising God for all that they heard and all that they saw just as it had been told them. I don't know what story you're you're telling yourself this season. I don't know what story you're going through. Maybe it's one of hurt, Maybe it's one of depression. Maybe it's one of negativity. Maybe it's one of lies. Maybe it's one of hopelessness. Whatever the feeling that you have, whatever the story you find yourself in, it's not going to do you any good to say, I I wish I wasn't here. I would love to be joyful. But I, I believe God wants to impart to us today a greater story over our lives. And it doesn't take more effort on your path. It doesn't take more more energy, more strength. It's not by strength. It's not by might, but it's, come on, it's by the Spirit of God. We trust Him to do the work. We could never reach Him. We could never get up to Him. We could never have a right relationship with Him. He came down to us. Emmanuel, God is with us. The only way To ruin a story is to make us the main character. And the only other way to ruin a story is to make sure that that story never becomes personal. Never becomes personal. 
But the moment that we make it personal, the moment that Jesus isn't just one birth of many, but it's a birthing story of a son who then changes our life. And we take the words literally, we hold on to them because we know that he has the words of eternal life. When we hold on to his words, we'll never see death. When we hold on to his words, we're set free, free from hell, free from sin, free from death. He conquered everything. And all we have to do is hold on and trust. We make the story personal. That's the Christmas story that Jesus wants us to invade every aspect of our lives. Will you stand with me? The shepherds had a response and they started with fear. And then they saw the angels, they saw a multitude of heavenly hosts singing glory to God in the highest. And after they saw a baby and a manger, the Messiah, they came back glorifying God and praising Him for everything that they heard, everything that they saw. I don't know what you're seeing, but let's look at a different story. Let's look at the story that God sent His Son down. A king came down to earth to tell stories and in those stories contained eternal life. Let's hold on to the words like our lives depend on them. Let's hold on to the words of God so that we can be set free. Let's hold on to the words so that we can be healed and whole. Let's hold on to the very life that God offers because Jesus is the truth, He is the way, and He is the life. Amen? We're gonna sing a, a song and we're just gonna declare it over our lives. We're gonna declare joy to the world. And I believe as we're singing this, God wants to impart joy in us. Not, not, a, not a happiness, a joy that is attached to the very character and the nature of God, who is consistent, unyielding, stable,